Shalom. Do you even know what it means? Look it up. So great to be with you guys tonight. As Paul said, I am Deacon Ralph Poyo, and I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's important. That's really important. What he didn't share with you is that I am a permanent deacon of the Diocese of Raleigh. I am married to my high school sweetheart, Susan. And in a little over a week, we will celebrate our 29th wedding anniversary. Can I just tell you how cool it is to be able to say that I love her more today than the day I got married to her? That is so awesome to feel and to know. We uh, dated through high school. We were high school sweethearts and dated all the way for five and a half years and they got married after we both graduated or got out of college. Um, and I have five daughters. I know, it takes a while to get used to. Five daughters, so that means, including my wife, I live with a six-pack of women. That's pretty scary when you think about that. Six of them. If I had known that I was gonna have so many women, I would have invested in toilet paper companies, and I would be filthy rich today, simply on our own consumption. It's amazing, it's horrifying. My two oldest daughters, Sarah and Rachel, I was a youth minister for almost 25 years, and there was a time there when they were both in my youth group. And it was Sarah's senior year, and it was the last retreat of the year. This was her, her last retreat. And I have very specific rules on a retreat. It's Saturday night, we're going home tomorrow. So I want you to know that lights out are at 11 o'clock. So that means I want you in your bed at 11 o'clock, not five minutes later, not two minutes later. I don't want you brushing your teeth. I don't want you doing any of that, so I, and I'm very serious about that. Well, my two little girls decide that they're going to jump into the shower at 5 till 11. And of course, I know they're not going to be done because they're never done in five minutes. So they jump in the shower, and I'm like, you know, doggone it, they're taking advantage of me. And this is really hacking me off. So I'm like, you know, pacing around. I'm getting, now how am I going to handle this? Because they're my daughters. And, and I, you know, they need to be firmly punished, but yet they're my, you know. So well, how do I, and I'm looking down and all of a sudden I look in the corner of this room, this retreat, we're at this like this campground, this YMCA campground. And in the corner on the floor, is this big honking dead cockroach. And I think, okay. I went to a couple of my volunteers. Do we still have some of that popcorn? Yeah. Pop it. So they go to the microwave, pop some popcorn. I go over to my little toolbox, which I take with me on all my retreats, and I get out my spool of twine. And I take the cockroach, and I tie a knot, and I've now got this sucker dangling on. So my daughters have to come through the cabin that has the bathroom into the hallway and then into with their cabin that doesn't have a bathroom. So I take tape and I tape it up on the top of the doorway, dangling down, oh, about head height for them. And then the, me and the rest of my leaders, we pull up a chair and we sit down and we're just eating popcorn, watching the hallway. <laughs> and we're all just kind of snickering, can't wait to see what happens. And of course, my daughters are making all kinds of noise as they're leaving that room, going into their room like, you know, they're thinking, yeah, my dad's a youth minister, we can do whatever we want. And of course, Rachel looks back and says, yeah, 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 and she doesn't see that her hair now has bumped into the cockroach and she's pushing it and the cockroach now swings around to the side and now finds its place in between their two faces. You know, there's just very few moments in life <laughs> as a father when you just love your kids so much. <laughs> and this was just one of those moments. As I 
watched my daughters gain eye contact with themselves, the cockroach, and then each other, and then they went, ah! <laughs> and the rest of us leaders sitting down are just eating our popcorn, and now popcorn has gone flying, and we are laughing in hysterics. And they're like jumping, freaking out, grossed out. Oh, it's disgusting. And I said, and what time is it? Shut up, Dad! <laughs> and off to their cabins they go. See, they chose to make this decision. They chose to decide, you know what? We don't care about what Dad's rules are. We're going to do whatever we want. But Dad was ready. Amen? Amen? So the moral of the story is, don't mess with your fathers. <laughs> We're watching you. Anyway, seriously, what kind of decisions do we make? And why do we make decisions? And how do we learn how to make decisions? Because, you know, the, the theme is chosen, so that means that someone had to make a choice. So let me take you back. Let me show you this first slide that we've got over here. When you were a kid and you went to a birthday party and you looked at it and the mom said, here, would you like a piece of cake? And what did we do as kids? We looked around and we go, oh, I love that frosting. Let me get a corner piece. How many people like the corner piece if you like the frosting? Yes. How many people like the end piece? How many people don't want too much frosting so you want the middle piece because it's too sweet? Yeah, you see what I'm saying? So we make this choice. What piece do you choose so you make a decision based on what you like and what you don't like? Okay, cool. Have you ever been in this situation? Next slide. Where all of a sudden you're getting ready to play kickball at recess. You and you are captain and the rest of us are standing there and we're going, oh my God, oh my God, please don't pick me last because they'll all think that I suck right? But we're sitting here, if you're the captain, then you're going, I want you, I want you, I want you, and why are we making that decision? Because you're good at kicking the ball, because you can catch the ball. So all of a sudden now we're qualifying who we're picking based on what they can do. We know that one. How about the next slide? How about this? You've all got your lunch assignments at school, and all of a sudden you realize none of your friends have the same lunch. Oh my God! What are we gonna do? We grab our tray, and then we begin that lonely, horrifying walk of thinking, Lord, please let me find somebody, somebody that I, so that I can sit next to them and not sit by myself, and everyone will think that I'm whatever, right? So all of a sudden we're fearful and what choice are we going to make? Who are we going to find and why are we going to choose to sit next to them? Next slide. How about this one? All of a sudden you're, you're going to a, to a conference and your BFF is not coming and who are you going to hang out with at this conference? What group of people in your youth group are you going to hang out with? Because if you're not with your friend, who are you going to be with? Yeah, you know. So now you're picking and choosing and trying to figure out who's who. How about this last one? Now it's time for college. Which college do you go to? What's the decision you're going to make? How are you going to ever decide which college you're going to go to? Let me ask you this question. How many of you are planning to go to college? OK. Well, if you're planning on going to college, how many of you um, know what you want to study at college? Okay? How many of you have already sent out applications? How many of you asked God which college you should go to? Very few hands rose that time. Well, just out of curiosity, um, who loves you more than anybody else? And who created you? And who knows what's best for you? So tell me again why we're not asking God which college we should be going to? That's interesting. Okay, well, here's the deal. Listen up, stick with me. We're at this place now where we've grown up. We're getting ready to head to college. We're in high school, and we know how to make decisions. We do it all the time. We're picking and choosing, and we're deciding what we want based on what we can get, what we like, what we want, yes? So there's only one other thing that we need to figure out since we're here at a religious conference, and that's this. What do we need to do so that God will choose us. Next slide. 
There should be one more slide. And maybe there's not. It's OK. I'll just go on. Awkward. <laughs> it's not that funny, man. OK, so really, though, isn't that how you feel? That's how I felt. I can't tell you, when I was your age, I would sit around all the time and just sit here and think, what do I need to do to get God to want me? What do I need to do? Because, you know, like I hung out with friends at school and some friends at school didn't want to be with me. Some friends at school didn't want to have anything to do with me because I wasn't cool, because I wasn't as tall as Paul. That's not funny. Why are you laughing at my shortness? Hobbit's rule, girl. Didn't you see the movies? But seriously, though, when I was your age, all I did is walk around and I sit here and I, and I compared myself to everybody else. I'm totally freaking out the camera guys. Are they watching me? Here I am. No, seriously. Every time I'm running around, I try to, I, I, would you like me? Would you want me? And then all of a sudden, I find myself trying to be good and trying to make myself likable so that you would accept me, so that maybe you would want me. Because I wanted to have friends. I wanted to have people who would like me, who would want to be with me, who'd want to spend time with me. Don't bring the microphone near the speaker. All I wanted to do is to just be loved. Ever felt that way? Ever felt like you got to sit there and you got to do for other people. You can't hang out with a group unless you hang out with them. Oh no, it's a camera guy. Run. Okay, so. So the point is this. Is the world is the one that's been telling us that we have to produce so that we can be chosen. But that never once has been what God desired or what God said. God is not sitting there with a ruler saying, you have to reach this point, otherwise you're not going to be selected. Unless you do X, Y, or Z, you won't be loved. In 1 John, it says this, chapter 4, 19, Paul referred to it. We love because... He first loved us. We're capable of loving because he first loved us. And you know what? Before you had a day, a second, a minute to try to prove your worthiness of anybody else's love, Jesus had already died for you and me. Before you went out and tried to prove yourself to the rest of the world to say, I'm a good person, I'm worthy of being a part of your group, I'm worthy of being a part of, of a relationship, of a friendship, Jesus had already died to show you you have already been chosen. You never once had to earn the love of God. It cannot be earned. It is freely given because he is love and because he chose to love you and me. It took me forever to figure that out. In the Gospel of Luke, there's a great story. I love this story. It's one of my favorite stories because it's the first biblical evidence of the existence of hobbits. <laughs> patron saint, baby, patron saint. All right, here it goes. Luke 19, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not see because he was, here it is, short in stature. So he ran up ahead, climbed a sycamore tree to see him because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by to that place, he stopped, looked up, and he said, Zacchaeus, come down from that tree because I need to stay at your house today. That blew his mind. You got to understand who Zacchaeus really was. He was a tax collector, also known as a publican, which means he worked for the Romans and he would collect Roman taxes from the Jews. But you see, the Romans would say, Zacchaeus, I want you to collect two bucks from every person. 
That's what Rome asked of Zacchaeus. But Zacchaeus would say, the Roman tax is $3. So he'd take two from you, give it to the Romans, and take another buck for himself. Meanwhile, he's getting paid by the Romans to collect the two bucks from you. The Jews did not like tax collectors. Have you ever been in a situation where you weren't liked? Have you ever been in a situation where you tried your best and still you weren't acceptable? Have you ever been in a situation where you tried to break into a crowd of friends and they didn't want to have anything to do with you? Why? Oh, they would tell you things. Sorry, you're too short. Sorry, you're not good enough to do this. Sorry, I don't want you on my team because you can't do X, Y, and Z. Okay, so I'm going to say something very profound right now. Here it comes. Listen, tune in. When you take God out of the equation of our lives, everything is based on comparison. Let me say it again. When you take God out of the equation of our lives, everything is based on comparison. But the moment you choose to instill God into your life, infuse him and bring him in, it is no longer about comparison. It is about God looking at you and saying, I choose you. I choose you. Not because you look great. Not because you're 6'4 or 5'2 or because you have a 4.0 GPA or because you're good at athletics or you're good at playing an instrument. I just choose you because you were created for me. You were created for love. And you will never be happy ever until you are free to love. But this world will not let you be free. <clears throat> so Zacchaeus is up in a tree. I can totally relate. Because when I've been in a crowd, I can't see over the crowd. So I'm trying to find a vantage point. How do I get up higher? Don't worry, I'm not going there. I'm trying to climb higher so that I can see. The crowd will not let me look through because the minute I say, excuse me, can I get by you? They're going to look at me and go, you tax collector, get out of here. I don't want to have anything to do with you. You see, I couldn't socialize with the rest of the crowd if I was Zacchaeus. Nobody wanted to be around me except for the people that wanted to benefit from my wealth. So those were other people like tax collectors or prostitutes or other people that the rest of the normal society would consider as sinners. But all of a sudden, Jesus comes walking by. Now, here's where we got to get stuck in our heads. Jesus comes walking by, and he says, Zacchaeus. He called him by name. He called Zacchaeus by name. He didn't just say, you, what's your name? Come on down. No, he said, Zacchaeus. Do you understand the gravity of just that comment? Don't you understand that before the world was created, Jesus Christ knew that he would encounter Zacchaeus in the tree that moment. Before the world was created, he knew he was going to encounter Zacchaeus right there. Now, do you know what that means? That means that before the world was created, Jesus Christ knew that he was going to encounter you this weekend, right here, right now, for whatever reason you are here. Right now. The question is this, what are you going to choose to do? Because as Paul described, you could sit there with your arms crossed and say, I don't want any of this stuff. My mother threw me on a bus and lied to me and told me I was going someplace I wasn't. I don't want to go and open myself up. Or maybe you're so bound and unfree to be yourself that you've got, you got to wear this mask. And you've got to sit there and it's all about the look and it's all about pretending to be somebody that you're really not. When inside, behind the mask, in your heart of hearts, where no one else can see because you never are free to let them, you're desperately alone. When no one else is looking, you're at home and you're staring at yourself in the mirror. And you ask the quiet questions that you would never verbalize out loud in public. Why would anybody want me? I mean, look at me. How could somebody love that? You see, we're all in the same boat. We think we're alone. We think that the feelings and experiences of our lives makes it just only what we experience. But the truth is, everybody spends so much time lying and pretending to be somebody that they're not, 
that we're sitting here thinking that everybody else has it together and I'm the only one stuck in this situation. And I'm here to tell you that those are lies from the pit of hell. Anytime you ever question whether or not you are worth anything, all you have to do is go to the cross. Because it's the cross that no one likes to see with Jesus still on the cross that helps us remember that he came for you and me. He came for us. See, that's what made the difference for me. When I was a senior in high school, see, I was a broken little boy wearing the mask, trained to be, pretend and live these lies. I was a soccer jock in high school. I wanted to be a professional soccer player, pray for the national team, the Olympics. I had all those dreams. In fact, I could honestly say that in my senior year, in my high school years, soccer was my real God because Jesus, I had already gotten confirmed and I was done, I was gone. But you see, I only knew a little bit about Jesus. I never came to meet Jesus until I was a senior in high school. I was so busy chasing my other gods, so busy trying to find my happiness in other people or things or activities, all the while closing off my heart, all the while pretending that I'm so happy, that life is so good. I could even go to one of those parties where there's lots of alcohol and drinking and I could get quasi drunk and I could sit there and say, oh man, this is just awesome. And then go home and puke my guts out and say, and why did I do that? Because it was all about the look. It was all about playing pretend, about making everybody else think that I've got it all together when the truth is that in my heart of hearts, I was alone. I was desperate. I was so broken. I really believed that I was unlovable, that I wasn't good enough, that I was insufficient, that, they, that all the girls would want a Paul George because he is so big and buff, that they, that they would look to somebody like that and I'm looking at myself going, why? What is there about me that is of any value, really? I had all those questions, I had all those struggles, and I kept wondering, and I kept trying to give myself to people and trying to say, here, here, how about this? Let me do this for you. And, and, I, and, I, and I was trying to please everyone and please no one. And most of all, I was so unhappy. Do you understand what I'm saying? Are you feeling the same feelings that I feel? Because that's what I experienced when I was in high school. I was lost so lost, so filled with lies, thinking that this world really had something to offer me when they were nothing. I went the drug route, I tried some of that. I went the soccer route. At 15 years old, I had an opportunity to try out for the U.S. national team for 15 and under, 16 and unders. I made the state of Florida team, made the southeastern region team. Then I went to Jackson, Mississippi and tried out for the national team. Four teams of 18 guys trying out for 18 spots. I walked into the coach's office at the end of the uh, workouts of the tryouts after a week-long tryout in Jackson, Mississippi, sat down. He says, Mr. Poyo, congratulations. You're one of the top 18 players in the country. Unfortunately, we've had budget cuts. So you have now effectively made a team that no longer exists. Thank you for coming. I was heartbroken. But you know, it was one of the best things that ever happened to me in my life. Jesus Christ came and he slew my false God. I'm going to give you one other profound thought. Here it comes. Let this sink in. If you place your value and worth on anyone or anything that can be taken away from you, you're putting it in the wrong place. Let me say it again. If you're placing your value and worth on anyone or anything that can be taken away from you, you're putting it in the wrong place. Let's just say I had made the team and I got, uh, I, I started working out with the team and then the following summer I was supposed to go to France. That's where the tournament was going to be and I was going to represent the United States. But two months before the tournament, I get in a bad car accident and I break my femur. Do you think the national team wants me then? No. Now I'm a dead, dead slot on the roster. Or ladies, maybe you're out there thinking, you know what, if I can just do something with my look, 
Maybe I even can go so far as to have myself surgically augmented to look different, that I can make myself look more pretty. That's going to give me value and worth. But you know what? The minute that you go and you do that and you get in a car accident and your face is disfigured, does that mean you're no longer worth anything? The world would say yes. But Jesus says, no, that is not true. Or gentlemen, you're out there and you're trying to become just so super smart, so you're, you're basing your value and worth and your intellect and your ability to, to, to retain knowledge and then come back with tests and get straight A's, but you have that car accident and now you have a head injury and now you have a 25% capacity of what you used to have. Are you worthless then? The world would say, oh gosh, yeah, you're just not quite. But Jesus says, no, you are so valuable. You want to know how you are chosen? Do you want to know how you were chosen? You were chosen because you exist. He took time, energy, strength, creativity to make you just the way you are. You are not a mistake. The difference is, my brothers and sisters, is that we are deeply chosen, specifically chosen. He sees you. He knows everything about you. The scripture says he knows how many hairs are on your head right now. You are chosen. So much chosen that Jesus chose to die just for you. Yes, he died for the world, but he died just for you. How do we know? The parable of the good shepherd. Will not the good shepherd leave the 99 to go after the one? That's what I learned, that Jesus Christ came and he died and he chose this one broken little boy named Ralph and he loved him so much that he was willing to sacrifice and get brutally beaten to the point of death and then hang on a tree and he did it just for me. And the moment that became intimate and personal, it rocked my world. Let it come in, let it sink in. When Zacchaeus encountered Jesus, he got down from the tree and he ran up to the Lord and he said this. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anybody, anything, I will pay them back four times as much. And this is what Jesus says to him. Here it comes. Listen, because we're wrapping up. Jesus says, Today, today, salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. Here's the kicker. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. And that's what I found out when I was a senior. I found out that I was chosen that Jesus chose freely to come after me. He chose freely to create me with my unique height. That you know what? I was talking to George at dinner tonight and I said, oh man, you know when I come back and we get our new bodies in heaven, I'll probably be as tall as you. And I said, but I don't think I want it anymore after I've been flying around the country. Because when I sit in that plane, I am sitting in serious comfort. And Paul George is eating his kneecaps. You see, I was so busy looking at what everybody else has that I forgot to stop and to examine how awesome God made me. So maybe you've come here tonight and you're thinking, you know, I'm just a part of the crowd. I'm just a part of the group. I'm nothing special. Jesus would beg to disagree. You are something special. You were chosen. You were chosen. He made you. And you're worth dying for. The difference is, my brothers and sisters, is that maybe you are like me, and that is that maybe you are lost. Because you know what? This weekend, redemption salvation 
has come to you. Salvation has come to you. The question is, are you really looking for it? Or do you still want to play games with Satan and all the lies of the world? Because Satan will play. Or will you be like a Zacchaeus and say, I just want to get close to Jesus. I don't know him. All I know is what people have said about him. I just want to get close to Jesus. Are you ready to get close to Jesus? Are you ready to open up your hearts, to dispose yourself, to say, God, if you're real, if you really are real, then I want to experience your life this weekend. Do you want to go there? So then let's bow our heads and let's pray.